Uh, please ask your questions anytime in the, in the discussion. I'll start with uh, my philosophy. Theory without practice is empty and practice without theory is blind. This has served me well over my years in the industry. Uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn. You can read. I can read about my ideas on Medium. I will use uh, analogies and metaphors to convey some ideas, and I'll start with the first one. There are two avatars. One is muscular. Another is uh, fat. Both of these might have the same body mask, body mass index. Does it mean that both of them are have a similar fitness? Obviously, they don't. One metric, the body mass index uh, metric, can uh, hide more than what. It reveals. Now, instead of one single metric, had we looked at two different matrices, lean muscle mass and fat percentage. If we had these two parameters for both of the avatars, we can clearly say that the avatar on the left is, is a fitter person compared to the avatar on the right. I'll give more. Uh, uh, examples from the fitness world. Virat Kohli is a fantastic cricketer. He is fairly strong as shown by the weightlifting uh, pictures. He is incredibly fast. He is very flexible. And he has tremendous stamina. If not for his qualities, the various dimensions to his uh, uh, to him, I don't think he would have been as successful as he is. The takeaway from this slide is Virat Kohli's excellence is not in uh, one or few dimensions. He is excellent in multiple dimensions and they, they holistically contribute to his excellence as a cricketer. I will use uh, this as a uh, to set context for the uh, terminologies I'm going to introduce in this talk. Speed, stamina, flexibility, batting, fielding, fortitude, these are dimensions. The speed being high, stamina being high, all of these together contribute a vector, which I call the dimension vector. You can group some dimensions into categories. Things like speed, stamina, and flexibility, I would group them in in the physical dimension. Similarly, batting and fielding, I would group them into the skilled dimension and so on. I'm going to apply these concepts, this terminology in the context of databases in the subsequent part of this talk. Talking uh, again, more analogies from sport. Jockey ride horses in horse races and there are basketballers, gymnasts and weightlifters. The ideal physique of a jockey is that they are uh, they're not tall. They weigh less. We don't care about their stamina or strength. While to excel in basketball, uh, they need to be tall and have good stamina. While a gymnast needs to have good flexibility and decent strength. While to excel in weightlifting, it might help if the, I mean, the lifters themselves are heavy and they have strength. The takeaway from this slide is 
to excel in different sports. You may require different dimensions to uh, of of physical characteristics. Uh, what is a great uh, physique for weightlifting might not be a good physique for basketball and vice versa. The same is true in modern application development. A data store meant for in uh, which is good in one context might not be the best in a different context. So given this, given that there are many data stores, each with the different uh, choices, how would we go about understanding, evaluating, and choosing data stores for our applications? This, to my knowledge, is not a well uh, understood area. This uh, picture is the best I have found so far in the Internet. Rocky talks about two different dimensions. One is the use case, other is a data type. Based upon these two dimensions, he is recommending how to go about and pick a data store. While I agree, while this is a good start, two dimensions seem uh, uh, significantly a small number given the complexity of modern applications as well as the uh, the complexity and the richness of what data stores provide. In the rest of this talk, I will talk about various dimensions, their categories, and so that uh, we can figure out the best database data store technology for our applications. Any comments, questions so far? No, we are good. Okay. Thanks. So I'll start with the first category, the data model or the entity model. There are plethora of database models. There is a relational model, the key value stored, white column, graphs, document stores, time series. I can go on. Compared to what we had a few, maybe a couple of decades ago, the richness of data models that are now available is significantly higher. The next dimension I talk about is a storage medium. Historically, we have all assumed that data, the primary uh, storage layer is, is disk, hard disks or uh, SDDs. This is no longer true. You have data stores like Redis, Memcache, and Aerospike, which use main memory as their predominant layer. They might use uh, disk as well, but it is important to understand that they make different trade-offs. Main memory is significantly, uh, the capacity of main memory is smaller compared to that of disk. At the, at the, on the flip side, they are significantly faster. So if latency, if response time and latencies are your primary criteria, you have to uh, think about this particular dimension of your application. Now, Say uh, you're on Facebook, you need to know your, you may have your friends. On Twitter, you may have your whom uh, you may follow somebody and people may follow you. So you have references from one table to another table. The ability to support references is one of the key attributes in choosing data stores. There are some data stores which, uh, there are few data stores which su support references and many that don't. Relational and graph databases 
support references. Uh, folks, I had shared my slide deck. Is it available in the? Arvind, have you shared it in the? It will be available in the video recording. When we put it in the YouTube, yeah, it will be available as a link. The next dimension I want to talk about is schema enforcement. In relational databases, you can specify the columns, names, and the types of these columns. Once this has been done, uh, the database prevents illegal data to be uh, entered. So if a column were to be uh, integer, a string might not be accepted within the per database. I call this uh, strict schema enforcement. While document data stores like MongoDB, they as they expect uh, say JSON, but within JSON they don't really enforce much of what schema can be used. Uh, what schema the documents have to adhere to before they can be persisted. I call this shallow schema enforcement. There's a third category which I find in data stores like Cassandra. Cassandra provides a query language CQL with which uh, via which you can create and manipulate, you can define data and manipulate data. Now, as long as you are using the CQL, things like uh, you can't use characters into an integer, that kind of validation can be done. But at the storage level, these kind of checks are not necessarily followed. So there is a hybrid op uh, option that Cassandra provides. And again, you have row oriented databases and you have column oriented databases. In a row oriented database, all information corresponding to a row are co-located. This allows certain kind of optimization. In a column oriented data stores, all data belonging to a column across different rows are co-located. This allows optimizations for things like max, min, sum, average across rows can be computed efficiently. Now I'll move to the category of single node guarantees. Reads, writes are, uh, you can think of, you can, they can happen all or they can have, I mean, can group them together and expect all of these to happen or none of this to succeed or to, to, to take effect. This is atomicity. Some databases allow atomicity at multi operation level, while some do it only at a single operation level. Data stores like HBase and Cassandra provide atomicity at only at single operation level, while MySQL, Volt TV, Spanner, Redis, these provide multi-operation atomicity. Now, we can have constraints saying that uh, they cannot be a, a class without an instructor. They cannot be a person without a phone number. The maximum number of people and maximum number of tutors for a class is two. These are application level constraints which can be enforced at the data store level. These kind of guarantees are provided by uh, data stores like MySQL and Redis and not by the HBase, Cassandra, and so on. 
Now, data stores are critical to modern application development. They are usually under high throughput, and you can have multiple concurrent uh, concurrent requests happening to them. There are data stores have to choose between isolating one thread from the other, which provides data guarantees at the cost of minimized concurrency and hence throughput. So uh, there are trade-offs between this and the isolation levels talk about how, what choices data stores make or can provide to their uh, consumers to compromise on concurrency to increase throughput. Now, if you look at a data store like HDFS, which is a storage system, which is a file system, all data is immutable. All files are immutable. So it does not really matter how many concurrent threads are accessing the uh, that content because it is immutable. While other data stores do not uh, have to deal with uh, mutable data and hence there are trade-offs with concurrency. There are uh, multiple anomalies, if you were to say. Read uh, dirty reads, dirty writes, repeatable reads, uh, read skews, write skews, there are various anomalies. This is a fairly deep topic. I don't want, I mean, I will not spend enough more uh, time on this. There's a link I have shared in the bottom where he talks about uh, at depth. Now it is important to understand different applications might require different isolation levels. Your choice of data store should factor in what your application needs and what the data store provides. This is a snapshot of the maximum or the best available isolation levels that different data stores provide. It is important to understand, uh, to point out that databases which are fairly popular like Oracle do not provide the highest level of uh, highest safest um, isolation levels as shown here. Now let's take a snapshot of so far. Different databases provide different choices. Old DB, which stores its data in memory, does not near, uh, is not always the most durable system. If the system were to undergo a shutdown or a power outage, there is a possibility of data loss. But it provides the highest isolation level. It provides references. You can have foreign key relationships between uh, tables and so on. While Neo4j, it may not, it, it provides asset guarantees, but it does not provide strict schema uh, enforcement. You can have multiple nodes of the same type but they can have very different data. This can be both a blessing or a curse, depending upon your application. Some um, uh, very successful database like Oracle does not provide you the best isolation level. While a uh, extremely scalable system like Cassandra does not provide you multi-operation atomicity, does not provide you multi operation consistency, does not provide references, does not provide any great 
isolation levels and so on. Even within these five dimensions, you see that there are interesting combinations which would necessitate application developers to choose the data store in a, in a fine grained manner. Any questions, comments so far? One question uh, mm -hmm. with regards to the in memory databases. Mm -hmm. When you provision a VM, uh, RAM is uh, chosen and hard disk comes along with it. So how is the pro how do we how should we provision uh, for in memory databases? Let's say I have 100 GB of data. Does that mm -hmm. mean I need 100 GB times some number as a RAM or? OK, again. You are going into specifics. Okay, I sorry. have not worked with uh, these uh, first hand, okay. but, but I suspect that the amount of data they recommend to be stored in in the database, the data store, is uh, equal to the amount of available RAM. Okay, got it. Thanks. And, uh, yeah, in this case, you are comparing them without, you know, I mean, see, can we compare Cassandra with MySQL because they're all meant for different kinds of data, right? Exactly. That is my point. This whole conversation tells you that there are nuances between Cassandra and React, Cassandra and HSpace. Uh, MySQL and OldDB has some nuances. MySQL and Spanner have some overlaps or some differences. So instead oh. of just focusing on something like what uh, this gentleman had mentioned here. Your screen is gone. Yeah. So there was a slide where the author spoke about if you want relation, if you have structured data and you have uh, this is a use case, choose a relational database, which is an oversimplification. Even in the world of relational databases, there are choices to be made between, say, MySQL. Uh, yeah. I OK, got it. It is not a comparison, but even if you choose it, these are the problems. This is what is the tick mark. OK, those dimensions of each database. Got it. Yes. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, folks, any other questions? Let's move on. We can sure. come back to it. Thanks. Okay, now I'll move to the next topic. The next part of the presentation which is about partitioning. Partitioning is an overloaded term even in databases. What it here means, you, you can divide the data which database data store manages into partitions which are collectively exhaustive and mutually exclusive and go on to different machines. So if you have two replica, two partitions, partition one might have half the data, another other half will be in the other partition. Now, some data stores support partitioning. Some of them, they may not provide partitioning. You may have additional layers on top of it where you can manage, but uh, at a high level, you can categorize data stores into whether they support partitioning or not. Partitioning itself can be done by range, saying that keys from X to Y will be co-located. Or you can have hashing where seemingly consecutive keys might be stored on different partitions. So HBase is a data store which provides a partitioning by range, while data stores like Cassandra and Aerospike do consistent hashing. 
and I, I remember that Redis can provide um, custom partitioning as well. OK, time for me to ask some questions. Can a data store support references? Provide multi operation atomicity and support partitions. No. The answer is yes. OK. No references yes. and partitions. Okay. But your intuition is right. Databases like OldDB and Neo4j. They provide references within the same partition. They do not provide cross partition references. While Google Spanner provides references across partitions as well. As you would imagine, the latency for the writes and reads will be higher for a system like Spanner compared to say what a old DB or a Neo 4J would do. They're talking about overloaded. The words partition and consistency are overloaded. Partition spoke about a subset of data which is stored in on uh, which is co-located. There's another interpretation where a subset of machines form a partition and these machines might not be able to communicate with other machines for ephemeral or uh, uh, longer duration problems. The consistency has one meaning in the asset world saying that uh, say you can't have broken foreign key relationships and so on. There is another meaning of consistency, which is uh, if a piece of data has multiple uh, is precise stored in multiple replicas. Are these replicas, do they have the same value for that piece of data or not? So in the subsequent slides, I'm referring to different interpretations of consistency and partition. Uh, folks, you might be familiar with the cap theorem. I'll briefly talk about it, uh, about it and its variant called PAC ELC. If a data has multiple copies on different machines, and if it were to undergo a write, Subsequently, reads are attempted by communicating with different replicas. So there is a you can think there's a uh, piece of data with value key, uh, with the key K. It was at value V1. And this attempt to set it to V2. Now there are uh, after this write, there's a attempt to made uh, to read from it from multiple copies. A system is considered consistent if some of the nodes, all the nodes which give back an answer, give the same answer. But some nodes might not, might not be, they may not honor your request. Remember, I spoke about network partitions. Some set of replicas can communicate amongst themselves, but they might not be able to talk to communicate with other replicas. In that case, uh, one of these groups might still be functioning. The other group might say, hey, I cannot service your write or read. This is consistency. Availability is all replicas will can come can respond to the queries, but they might give different answers. Some of them might give the V1 version. Other uh, others can give the V2 version. This is called availability in the cap world. Similarly, 
in the absence of any network issues, you can still make a trade off between latency and consistency. A, a system which favors latency ensures that you get a response back as soon as possible. Again, the responses might return different versions. Or the system can choose. To be slow. But ensure that the same version is available on different replicas. This is the famous cap slash PAC ELC theorem. Now these again are dimensions of the data store. Data stores like HBase choose consistency in the presence of partitions and in the absence of partitions, they still choose consistency. While Cassandra, in the absence of partition, in the presence of partitions, it chooses, it does not try to be consistent. While Aerospike provides an option to configure to allow the users to choose whether they want to pick value one or value two. And in some cases, they may provide that only upon uh, additional subscription license, which the they charge to their consumers. So you can have data stores which can which can support a subset of these four combinations. So again, this is a key aspect of databases. Your application might return different values for the same key depending upon which replica they hit. If the application has not chosen consistency. Or uh, the uh, APIs, the request to these data stores might undergo, might exhibit higher latency, but can provide consistent data. Uh, this is a good time for me to ask uh, to take questions. Does anybody have questions? I think people will ask in the last. Yeah, Inderjit seems to have questions. Yeah, Inderjit. We are not able to hear you, Inderjit. Some problem with your mic. OK, let's move on. Uh, we'll circle yeah. back at the end of the session. Folks, whether all the replicas have the same data or not is one end of a spectrum. You can have further choices where you can say a, a, a client can will read their write. If operation one precedes operation two, you see both of them or none of them and so on. The lowest guarantee is called the eventual consistency. Here they say that. Replicas can diverge. As in uh, for the same key, you can have multiple values. But eventually all replicas will contain and return the same value. If there is no subsequent write. If there is exactly one write. Then. An eventually consistent system will converge. To the same value. There is a variant of this called the strong eventual consistency. Here. The guarantee is that all replicas will return the same value. Even if there are more than one write. 
these are even before I mean, if they're right before they all converge. So conflicts is a situation where different replicas might have different values for the same key. Now let's consider a counter which is value one. There are two updates happening. One increments the counter and one decrements the counter. A strongly eventual system can converge to 0, 1 or 2. All of these three are valid values for a strongly eventual, eventually consistent system. The takeaway from this is applications invariants might be broken if you choose a eventually consistent system. Now, systems which are eventual strong, which display strong eventual consistency have to detect conflicts. That is, they realize that for a given key, different replicas have different values and they need to provide mechanisms to so that a single value single version uh, will be promoted or will be merged different data stores which which do not provide strong consistency have to provide conflict detection and resolution mechanism Cassandra provides a last writer wins. So they provide, they check timestamps on different versions. Whichever replica has the la latest timestamp, it is considered to have the latest copy and it is, that is considered to be the, the right version. Unfortunately, uh, clocks on different machines might not be in sync. It might be possible that a uh, newer write can have an older timestamp and vice versa. In which case, the wrong version of the data uh, might be kept. So think of it as somebody has uh, placed an order, paid for an order, and then the order moves to a not paid state. This is an example of a broken application experience because of using a data store which has a which employs last writer win strategy. The other data stores which detect conflicts, but they call they provide both the versions the application and say, hey, for this key, I have version V1 and version V2. Hey, application, tell me which of these versions should I consider to be the right version. They pass the responsibility back to the application. This is the client driven resolution uh, mechanism. The third is uh, employed or, uh, by data source like React. They employ data structures called uh, CRDTs, Convergent Replicated Data Types. So think of increment, uh, you have sets. Addition to set will create the, um, a set can be modeled as additions to a set and deletions to a set. You can merge these two to find the actual set. So CRDTs are mechanisms where you can have addition in multiple replicas, but when they converge, you have one single unified set independent of what order were things added. So 
CRDTs are supported by data stores like React. Now talking about replication, how, how do uh, updates percolate to each replica? The different flavors again. There is a single master replication where all updates go to one single node, which will communicate with the other replicas. There is multi master where you can have rights going to multiple replicas and they have some mechanism of communicating, resolving conflicts. The third variant is masterless. So even a non replica node uh, can handle replication. The takeaway here is single master is slow but has fewer inconsistencies. Multi master has is fast but can create more uh, conflicts and so on. If a system is not strongly consistent, any choice of replication will permit conflicts. So folks, another of the dimensional uh, matrix. MySQL does not support partition. HBase provides partitioning and the partitioning is by range. It is consistent in the presence of partitions and in the absence of partitions. It employs single master and there is no uh, scope for conflicts. Cassandra uh, doesn't have, uh, doesn't choose consistency. It permits conflicts and it provides an automatic conflict resolution which might break your application assumptions. So even within the context of partition, the categories of partitioning and replication, you see that different data stores make different choices. All of them can manifest in different ways at the application level. Now, if you merge, if you include more of these categories in your decision making, you see that there are so many different dimensions. Some support ACID, some support ACI, but not D. Some provides different uh, levels of schema enforcement. Some provide partitioning, but they don't provide cross partition references. Some uh, provide uh, partitions, but they don't provide consistency. This is a fairly rich set of choices that each data store provides. And taking this view of vectors, dimensions, and categories allow us to interpret and understand what each provide so that you can customize, you can pick the right data store, data store or data stores for your application. I have spoken only about a, a few dimensions in this tech talk. I have not spoken about things like latency, throughput, efficiency, multi-data center support, disaster recovery, tuple size, cost, operation management. There are more. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about is claims versus reality. These databases might make claims, but the reality might not be uh, in sync with their claims. So even at that level, we as application developers might, might have to uh, apply test that theory versus practice and say, is this data store actually behaving as the claim in their documentation? Uh, I am at the end of my talk. Time for questions. Yeah, if you want to ask questions, unmute yourself. You all have permissions to unmute.
We have so to show you have, audience for you. Do you have Sorry. any priority uh, based on you know the kind of application like e-commerce, healthcare? So knowing some of those you know standard requirements, have you seen which is right or? Raja, I would. It is I think too ambitious to do it at a domain level. I work for Flipkart. Even within Flipkart, say the payment system might require different choices versus say the search system. So it may be uh, doing it at a domain level is too broad. Maybe doing it even at a subdomain level might not. It may also be um, maybe optimistic. Okay. And yes. to talk about this, I'll talk about Uber. Uber has is a low latency, high throughput system. And for their rider allocation, they were using a system which was not asset. This resulted in scenarios where you can have multiple uh, riders picking up or coming over to pick up one rider, or maybe even zero rider drivers to pick up one rider, and the rider thinks somebody has been assigned to him, to him or her. So Uber moved from a NoSQL solution to Google Spanner. Even within the context of a single application, over time their uh, needs might change. So I would not uh, make recommendations at a domain level. Okay. Now that you have researched so much, is, are there, is there any system given the priorities and preferences that recommends these are your choices by rank? No, I wouldn't say this is ranked. Given application the one might have a different set of choices versus application two. Yeah. Even in applications, sub part of applications may have different choices. Understood. Now, given my preferences, let's say I key in, I want this level of partitioning, that atomicity, uh, you know, uh, given the preferences, are there any recommendation systems? Uh, no. For my requirements. To my knowledge, my talk is a first um, okay. in this direction. Okay. Then I recommend you to build such a system. It will be very much in demand. Okay. Uh, that's really nice talk. Anybody else has any other questions from the audience, please? Um, that says uh, thing. Uh, so, Naveen, do uh, you have any more slides? Are we done? Uh, I'm done. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Naveen. This, uh, yeah, Lata has a question. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, am I audible? Yeah, yes, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just had a uh, general question though, but uh, first I would like to uh, thank Nami for the presentation. The slides were very, uh, they had good uh, detailed information. Uh, I would like to refer to it later. So my question is, uh, Generally, when we are learning about databases, like not just SQL query, right? The database mm -hmm. concepts, uh, like, uh, concurrency maybe or schema enforcement and stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you recommend any resource as such uh, that you think is uh, a good one to refer? Uh, Martin Klepman is an author to follow. Designing data intensive applications is a good but um, big book to read. You may find more uh, books on the relational databases. 
but uh, it's a it's a huge area with lots and lots of complexity. If you were to start, I would recommend you to follow talks by Martin Klepman and read his books and take pointers from there. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any others have any questions? Are we good to close otherwise? So uh, the deck is going to be the ready reckoner for me. Uh, and the deck will be available in our YouTube video link as a link in the YouTube video description. Uh, so I would uh, recommend all of you to keep this for the ready reckoners. And uh, Naveen has given wonderful sessions in Devopedia for functional programming. And uh, more on that, uh, this has been our third year uh, conducting this series of talks for Engineers Day. And we crossed about 100 plus sessions in Devopedia YouTube channel. Uh, so uh, it's all a landmark. Thanks for all the support. I would request all of you to uh, spread the word. Uh, and uh, thanks, Naveen, for a wonderful talk on the database choices, uh, data stores, as you had put it. I would uh, uh, cherish this session a lot. And thanks, everyone, for joining on a Friday for this talk. And uh, hope you all had a productive uh, uh, month that leads to this Engineers Day. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Naveen. Thanks for joining. Bye, everyone. Take care. Yep. Yeah.